Hey everybody, welcome back to Up The Vibe and today I have the great pleasure of talking to Jim Penniston together with fellow contributor James Rose. Jim Penniston has now retired from USAF Special Forces where he wrote Defense, Security, Counterterrorism and Contingency Plans for the USAF and NATO. Sergeant Penniston and his team were first responders to a security investigation of a craft of unknown origin located just outside RAF Woodbridge in England. In December 1980, this case is known as the Renaissance Forest Incident and is one of the most documented accounts in military history. Jim is a frequent lecturer and presenter at numerous MUFON events and a speaker at two national press club events. His first responders account of the Renaissance Forest Incident has been featured worldwide on numerous television and radio programs. And in addition, Jim, has been a contributor to other books concerning this phenomenon, including The Renshaw Enigma, which I highly recommend. Hi, Jim. How are you? And thank you for being on the podcast. Doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Yeah, um, it's a pleasure pleasure to meet you, Jim, and, and uh, we're really honoured that you give, really. us, give us your time. Yeah. No, I, I'm actually excited to, to hear new questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to have new questions. That's, you know? that's good. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah um, thank you so much for being on. I wonder if before we start into um, the questions, I wonder if you could introduce yourself a bit more, talk a bit about your background uh, leading up to becoming Staff Sergeant at Bentwaters. Oh, well, that's a, that's a different question, yes. <laughs> in brief. <laughs> yeah. in briefly, uh, you know, I entered uh, the Air Force in 73, uh, Um uh, the, the stuff that made, sets me aside, I think, uh, prior to that is that uh, within 10 months of being in the service in 74, I received my top secret clearance. And uh, I held that, you know, for the other remaining you know, 20 years I was in. Mm -hmm. uh, I had probably been to, let's see, not probably, I've been to uh, three, four other bases prior to going there. Uh, at Bentwaters. Uh, I did have another tour of duty early in 75 at uh, REF Alchemy. That's over by Cambridge, in case you guys don't know where that's at. Uh, I think, you know, it's probably closed. <laughs> I, they're, all, they're all closings. Yeah. I, don't think I don't think there's many open anymore. Uh, uh, maybe Lake and Heath is still open and Milton Hall maybe. Uh, but that's about it. And so... Uh, I worked the missile field in uh, Montana uh, prior to going there. Um, I was charged of security for uh, mm, 10 intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, and the, that wasn't the hard part. The hard part, they were spread over 50 square miles of land, and you had to respond to those uh, then. Uh, I don't want to get too much detail. I'll be here all night. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, uh, Do you want to talk a little bit about um, the incident itself then? So leading from the moment where you and John Burroughs um, spotted the craft to the point where uh, you touched the craft, if you could give a brief description of that, if you could. Okay. Uh, we had left our... I had left the vehicle. I set up Airman, Airman Kabanzak. Uh, he was, uh, all right, you got to keep in mind what we're doing is uh, what I was doing. <laughs> I was the only one who was running my checklist. What I was doing is uh, I was responding to a possible aircraft downing. So I took the vehicle as far as I could, um, and uh, I put Airman Kabanzak there. Uh, he had the only other radio besides me. And uh, he was going to act as the entry controller for the response responding forces that would come there for the crash. Uh, this is all standard operating procedures that we do and things like that. And then uh, Aaron Burles and I uh, proceeded uh, toward the uh, wood, uh, the forest uh, tree line. Uh, we had uh, various type of lighting and stuff that was going on uh if, you know from the distance at the east gate it looked like a bubble of white light as we got closer you know to the tree line it was uh, uh multicolored and it was uh uh starting to dim a little bit 
all the things that were pretty inherent to aircraft crashes up to that point in time i i've been to uh, a couple dozen aircraft crashes i mean okay. there were just too many but they all had inherent things like the coloring of you know titanium burning and fuel and stuff like that that so we were getting okay. those colors were not unusual but as I uh, got closer, uh, I maintained our security checks with the East Gate. Uh, that's where Sergeant Chandler showed up. Uh, he was the flight sergeant for Bentwaters. And uh, well, I was in charge of security for Woodbridge, so you had to have somebody else take my place, and that was Sergeant Chandler. And uh, as we approached, uh, I think the the oddity was probably the, the feeling of uh, – a physical feeling of uh, st- static electricity that was on the our clothing and face, hair, things like that. Uh, at first, I'll be honest with you, I thought it was uh, adrenaline. Uh, no, no matter how many yeah. times you go to them, it's just a shocking situation. Yeah, I mean, you're, uh, you're coming up to a crest. Uh, you know, you've, uh, you've yeah. done it before, but, you know, the adrenaline they're is not, They're not body. pleasant. Yeah, they're not pleasant. Okay, it's probably the most horrifying thing you can imagine, an aircraft crash. Um, anyway, uh, as I got closer, uh, so we had Kabanzak, I had Burles. He's about 40 feet this way. Kabanzak was another 50, 75 feet back to the entry control point. And as I approached going into the uh, forest, the light has uh, dimmed down considerably. And um, uh, I wasn't receiving any more uh, transmissions from Central Security Control. Uh, I could uh, barely hear Kabanzak. Uh, he was relaying my messages. I still transmitted, uh, you know, security AOK, you know, whatever the codes were at the time. And uh, then the lights had pretty much dissipated, but there was, uh, the forestry service had, they plant those as a crop, those trees. So they had berms, earthen berms, and they stood about anywhere from two to four feet high. And so I couldn't exactly see what was behind the one berm. It was just lit. I could see light coming out. Mm-hmm. <coughs> <coughs> oh, oh, there's there's that cold. I'm <laughs> sorry. No problem. Doing very well. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry about that. I'm going to do that throughout this. I guarantee you. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. I think it's going to stop. Uh, then there was, uh, uh, as I approached it, I could feel, you know, other, uh, uh, things that were transpiring that just made no sense to me at all. Uh, like, uh, my, my movements were labored. Uh, I used the comparison, the analogy, uh, it would be like walking waist deep through a pool of water, that type of resistance I was having. Were you having, uh, um, what emotions were you having? <coughs> were they kind of, um, a bit of fear, trepidation? Was there curiosity there? Maybe skepticism. Well, the fear had left uh, because at that point in time, I was close enough where I terminated the security response option for uh, downed aircraft because I knew it wasn't a downed aircraft. Okay. Uh, I initiated a uh, security response option, what what is called a helping hand situation. Um, That's Air Force term. It's probably, I'm sure it's still used. Uh, it's uh, when uh, there's a possible hostile uh, uh, situation is in front of you uh, that could affect the priority A, B, or C resources of the, you know, the base operating. Okay. Uh, so there, there's it's for a threat, and that's the way I had to treat. Because of the time, it was just that, uh, you know, it was uh, the Cold War was on. We were having a lot of difficulty uh, over in Europe at the time, and. Uh, we're not even talking about the terrorist groups, a different type of terrorist group. They don't have these, those groups anymore. Uh, uh, so we, we also had uh, uh, 
occasional like things like Russian trawlers and stuff like that yeah. that would come into the port there. And so, yeah, yeah, we, we initiated the, uh, the security situation. Uh, as I came up over the, the, the crest of the berm, uh, well, it was clear, uh, the, 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 this white light that was starting to dissipate, the forming of a black triangular craft. And, uh, I knew it was a hostile because you know, the last thing that I would think is someone going to fly in a craft into a forest that has their trees separated maybe by six or seven feet. There's, it's impossible, you know. That was one of the things I was co- confused about. How did it land there? Yeah. I mean, it. it <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it. Even helicopters require. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, space. So, uh, so yeah. at the time, it's when you give your account in the book, it sounds like that uh, everything was quite procedural in terms of the steps you would take um, and the all the all the training that you'd had on how to deal with a situation like this. But at the same time, things are happening which are quite odd and out of out of place. So, to what extent was was your frame of mind kind of kept on the procedural side versus what's going on here? Well, I. After the termination of the um, the SRO for aircraft crash and initiation of the uh, helping hand, uh, it went pretty ad hoc after that. Okay. I mean, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm gonna, <clears throat> I must say that one of the things that kept me grounded, I would say, as, as best as it could be grounded, is I would try to go ahead and say, well, um, first of all, up to this point, I mean, there was when I was at Offutt Air Force Base prior to this, I was with the Sackley Guard, and it's your the bodyguards for like thirty six generals and all kinds of stuff like that. It, and you also did building security and also the briefings they would do with the other generals and stuff in NATO. Uh, there, that's in Omaha, Omaha, Nebraska, and you'd provide security outside these uh, doors, you know, for these highly top secret, you know, uh, uh, briefings. And most of them were on research and development. I mean, what kind of aircraft are we going to have 50 years from now? That kind of thing, or wish we would have in 50 years from now. Mm-hmm. And there was nothing that I ever seen at Offit in any of those top secret briefings that would even come close to the technology that I was observing. So that was perplexing. Okay. So it's not a Warsaw Pact nation. It's not ours. Okay. It doesn't leave a lot of options. Okay. Um, What what was the next, what was your next question? Well, uh, I guess I was thinking about, um, the, the emotions and what was the, um, the emotions quite are your emotions now uh, when you think about it quite raw still or is your memory quite vivid still do you feel oh it's vivid uh yeah yeah raw is a good one uh i tell you what i never do any events in december <laughs> none i don't talk i don't do anything with uh, okay. you know so december is a tricky month for you it's what, it's horrible later. it's a horrible month yeah. yeah, I mean, here we are, you know, 42 years later, it's going to be, you know, it's going to suck. I know that. It's just, so, uh, you know, and they say you can get used to things. I don't think you can get used to certain things. I think there's, mm-hmm. do you have trauma or something like that? There was trauma. Uh, I, had a, I had a mixture of emotions that were, like, rapid. I mean, going from fear at one moment to uh, high, high anxiety to uh at one point in time i was like i felt everything was okay and i didn't feel threatened uh and that's because the uh the craft itself you know just stopped doing things that looked like it was active like the lighting in the skin of the craft and things like that it got it got very just inert uh i wasn't sure if I was going to survive this, because I thought, well, first of all, it's not a Warsaw Pact 
country. It's not from us. Uh, you know, it's not from any Air Force I know of. So the chances are this is probably not a good situation to be in. So, and this is where I started to refocus. I, I said, uh, well, what you need to do is you need to obtain as much information as you can. Make sure it's passed on. So I kept my radio, I kept briefing on the radio, even though I couldn't hear a, a thing mm -hmm. back. And then I decided to pull my notebook out and, and do a, a do an on-ground investigation yeah. to get enough information, you know, so uh, whether something happened to me or not out there, it didn't matter. Uh, the information would be able to, be passed on to, you know, command authority, and uh, those folks would have the opportunity to make a decision what happened out there, you yeah. know. You must have felt quite alone, and you probably quite I was alone. Oh, I was alone. Yeah. I was alone. Yeah. I had Burroughs back behind me standing, and he was just standing there. He wasn't just frozen. This is the weird uh, thing. I mean, he's mentioned in other interviews that he didn't have the same experience as you, and I, I wonder... He don't remember he, anything. He doesn't remember anything. <laughs> no. He don't remember nothing. But that's that's not exactly true. Because when, when you know, when we went into the, uh, you know, within the, the two days after that, we went into the base commander's office and all that stuff. Hey, he, he drew a triangular craft. He talked about it. Uh, briefed uh, Colonel Hall about it, mm -hmm. and so he had fine memory. Where I, where I found out he didn't have memory at all is uh, when I uh, met him again, I think it was 10 or 15 years later. We were out of service by then, and he, he just told me, I don't remember anything. I said, oh, something happened there where you can't remember. Is that strange? Yeah, the yeah, but here's where, but in the book, I yeah. do talk about one of the things that came up there to explain that. And we are, it's a, it's a hypothesis. I don't know this for a hundred percent for sure, but we had actually meant, uh, excuse me, yeah, shut that off. We had met, uh, him outside the uh, law enforcement desk. I mean, this is like a week or two or maybe a week afterwards. Uh, it was myself and, uh, oh, a couple other people, and I mentioned them in the book who they are. And um, I said, "Where are you going?" He said, oh, "I got to go down the OSI building. They want to want to talk to me." I said, uh, "Just tell them everything." I says, "This hopefully this this goes away, you know." And he goes, "Okay, that's what I'll do." He said, "That's what I'll do." I said, "Okay," and uh, I I think because of what happened to me, uh, I think that uh, you know he actually uh, maybe had some type of uh, I don't know, something happened to them down there. I don't know. But, you know, it, uh, I've talked to people in the CIA and everything else that says, you know, those those memories can't stay. They can't keep them from you forever. You're going to remember eventually. Mm -hmm. I go, okay, like I went, oh, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. They go, oh. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't have an explanation for him. Yeah. Uh, I don't know one thing. He was young. He was a airman. uh he was excitable. He was terrible excited out there. Um, it caused me problems, actually. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, in the book, since you uh, did read that, Joe, um, in the book, um, uh, the thoughts I was having about John at the time and, and, and Ed and what was going on around me, uh, that is from the hypnosis session I had when I – got out of the service after I retired and I couldn't sleep at night. And that was one of the things that turned out being described, you know, and, and these are not like UFO people. Okay. These are like my, my medical doctor recommended a psychiatrist to help me with this. And, you know, uh, uh, so they had no attachment to this type of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was purely to help me sleep at night. And, uh, which they did help, uh, uh, with medication and stuff. That's, that helped. I still take the same medication today, matter of fact. But for, uh, for helping to sleep and stuff. Uh, it's, it's an alpha block blocker. It actually keeps you from, uh, like 
having terrifying, horrifying dreams. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's horrible. I don't know how to explain it to anybody. Oh, no way. It's bad, and uh, I, I, I don't want anybody to really understand how bad it is because it's bad. Because I don't I wish that on anybody. So that's why um, he just does, he doesn't remember. I don't know. I have no idea. It's one. It's one of those mysteries, but. Um... It, it seems like, I mean, you also mentioned, I think, in the book and that there was a sort of a weird time distortion going on that maybe your experience of time was different to his. Is that possible? Yes, that, that is a theory, okay? Uh, I, I like to s separate fact from theory, okay? That's my thought because it seemed like all the surrounding around me when I was up near the craft, let's say when the, uh, the bubble of it, that I called it in the book, the bubble area, within the five feet, eight feet of the craft. It seemed like everything outside this lighted area, first of all, I couldn't hear anything mm -hmm. out there. I couldn't, I didn't see any movement. I didn't see Kabansak wasn't moving. <laughs> I mean, he's yeah. a good 60, 70 feet away. So he wasn't moving either. So that's why I've come up with, this determination, and with others, right, you know, have theorized that this is a time distortion. And it makes sense, according to the people that researched it, because um, it uh, it seemed like it took a while for the what was happening at the craft to catch up with the exterior outside there. And uh, uh, one of the theories part of it is, is that Probably for um, uh, Airman Burroughs, it's it was probably instantaneous, you know, the time from the flash of light when we hit the ground. It's probably all instantaneous for him, and you don't remember anything. Uh, but believe me, I was pretty shocked to find out what he didn't know. I just see it don't make no sense to me either. As long as you brought it up, but don't make no sense. I was still in the service in. Uh, uh, 1990, and I think uh, Halt and Burles did a documentary. Um, uh, I can't remember the name of the documentary. Um, I think it Robert Stack was the host on it, but I can't remember the name of the documentary. And uh, anyway, they recreated it, and in that you know in that television segment, he describes. A triangular craft, the, th the three of us, looking at it, doing things with it. <laughs> and now it's like you don't know what's going on with it. I don't know. It's, yeah, it's uh, um, you know, those are questions you got to ask him. Can I, I, mean, can I um, Jim, this, is, this really is fascinating. And I just want to sum up some of the key points so far because and also link them back to uh, theories that have emerged within the contact community, and there seems to be some sure. parallels here. So first and foremost, <clears throat> your initial feeling um, was a feeling of static electricity. So the whole area, and how far off, how far away from this object were you feeling this feeling of uh, like a static energy in the air? Oh, the static energy, I felt, oh, 20 feet away. 20 feet away, but no... Yeah, it was really interesting on that part. Uh it had residual energy uh, because the the landing site there, because when uh, Sergeant Nevels went out there to investigate it, and he was sent out by the base commander, uh, Colonel Conrad, the following morning to investigate, uh, he felt the same thing. And I, I'm pretty sure he described it in, the, in his chapter in the book. The static electricity was still there. Mm -hmm. At the uh, landing site, so and that's with ab with the absence of the craft. So, so you uh, felt you felt that obviously this this object was giving off a substantial amount of energy, and you 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 had you physically felt that. That's very interesting. You going back to the point you made earlier on about the trans. You mentioned earlier on about the transmissions being blocked. Um, do you think? Uh, and you you only heard you, you heard very little stuff coming from the base. Do you think there's any possibility that maybe that energy release? was blocking uh, conventional communication systems for a short period of time? Oh, I think so, uh, because there's there's no way to, the the two the twin bases are only separated like from three miles apart. But between those 
twin bases and on the bases, we had repeating radio repeating systems all over the base. I mean, there's no way to have a dead spot. Mm-hmm. I mean, they had to be re- received. I in in the book, I just to cut to the chase on that. Uh, I I found out afterwards from Sergeant Coffee, the senior controller at Central Security Control, that. Because he hands me the fifteen sixty nine when I get in there the next morning, because I was going to write it. I got all my times. I'm converting them from military time to uh, for civilian time to military time, doing those kind of things. And he hands me the fifteen sixty nine, which is the incident complaint complaint report. See, a blotter entry is just, just what is a chronological entry that goes into his blotter what's happening and by time. And it's very brief, and it referred to the the incident complaint report and in there that was like a page and a half it was solid typed and that he hands it to me and i'm like he said really he said you already got the 1569 done uh you know and he says uh yeah and i went okay and i was trying like how in the hell does he know all the stuff that i seen out there it's because that was 100 percent correct because um he heard all the transmissions Every bit of them. He heard them. So, uh, in answer to your question now, James, there there was blocking, but it wasn't it wasn't blocking my transmission. I just couldn't hear them. Okay. Uh, so I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> that really that question. What would cause that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the, um, so basically, you've got a black triangular object that is obviously, this is based on the witness testament, manipulating space, time, and sound uh, in the area that it's, it's, it's landed. Yes. Uh, so it, I suppose coming on to a slightly separate point here, if bearing in mind that this sort of slowdown that you experienced, there's one question that, that I'd, I'd like to ask you now, and, and this is something I don't think you've ever mentioned in the, in the book. Have you okay. personally ever had uh, anything happen to you during your military career where you that in a, a involve what is traditionally known as a, a near-death experience? Uh, I... I, I, I I've been in some bad situations. Yes. Were you ever Were you ever um, revived uh, at all? Oh, no. or? Nothing okay. like that. No. Okay. No. That That's really near death. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> being, re- being resuscitated. I mean, that, yeah. That's no. Thank God for that. That's yeah. bad. Yeah. Uh, no. Sure. Sure. But but going on to to but the point you made about Burroughs and the fact that he he obviously recalled it, you know, and uh, in his briefing to to Colonel Hall. Um, do you think, and, and you mentioned about the OSI, um, uh, he had to go and speak, speak to OSI. It, it, were, were any of the, um, were any of your, your team, do you think that they were either threatened or scared of reprisals from, um, you know, the upper echelons of the military or the intelligence community at all? Uh, I don't know if it's that per se. I know they were, they were worried. They were concerned. Um, it was uh here's the thing we to report exactly what it possibly was is uh uh probably a career ender anyway and they're probably all worried about that um OSI yeah they they had a lot of investigative power <coughs> but um uh i knew most of the OSI agents uh the people that interviewed me weren't OSI uh I don't know who they were. So uh, I know one thing that uh, OSI at the time, um, <coughs> during wartime or during contingency operations, uh, they would actually fall under the State Department over there. So you can conclude what you want out of that, you know. Uh, yeah. I don't know. So the fear of it, uh, they were they were they were fearful that night. So I don't, <laughs> I don't. I'm not sure what the the fear was afterwards. So uh, but you uh, weren't you weren't threatened by senior officers. You weren't sort of coerced into trying to keep quiet. 
Nope. Now that's, that's, that's a positive piece of information, really, in as far as the, the typical view of, of, the, of the UFO community is that obviously that there's it's consent, continual uh, uh, discussion point is to what degree this has been covered up. Is there an ongoing cover up? Who is behind that cover up? And, and no one can answer these questions. Well, you know, it's what they did do is they did make a containment story, you know, right. they, you know, yeah. and, and they, they, they play right along with the UFO community with that, you know, so uh, that that fit in really well, especially when, you know, the, the, the following night uh, and day when um, Monroe Nevels was out there and Colonel Hall, um, it, um, yeah, they seen lights in the sky, and <laughs> you know, hey, that fit in pretty good. It, it does seem a sl- does does seem different to Roswell in a way. I mean, I, I see it as the <laughs> the English version of Roswell, but there, there is a difference in terms of the cover up because Roswell was reported as a UFO crash, and then then it obviously <laughs> things changed quite dramatically soon after. So it seems obvious that there was a, a very um, strong change of direction on on the narrative on that. But with Rendlesham, yeah. that, that doesn't seem to have happened, at least, it seems. Well, no, but what they did do is they, uh, you know, made everything top secret, like, after 24 hours. So any of the airmen or anything like that, they didn't have, they had secret clearances. They, and believe me, the Air Force gives those out, okay? <laughs> they're, they're, everybody had, like, serious secret clearances. And uh, unless they had a top secret clearance, which I did, and then Monroe Nevels did, and... Of course, Colonel Halt did. Yeah. I mean, they we were in a different circle of being in the know versus them. I mean, I was constantly being talked to, or we've been briefed, or uh, question more questions were asked, or stuff like that. Lots of meetings, and uh, it was pretty open. And in that environment, in that top secret environment, it was open because we were we were brainstorming to find out what we it could be, what it, what we thought it could be. Uh, we never did come to conclusions, uh, uh, but there's no doubt it wasn't one of ours. I mean, or it wasn't one of theirs either. <laughs> yeah. We knew that because there's just too much concern. Well, based on based on an understanding of where military technology is now, and not just not just military technology, but civilian technology as well. In this day, right now, right. Do you think it, the, the fact that, although, I mean, I, know Joe, I don't want to get in where Joe's questions later on about the hieroglyphs, uh, etc. but if, if the craft was, you didn't see any occupants, do you think there's any possibility that this, this craft could have been some kind of drone? Un, unmanned? Yeah. Uh, without a physical pilot? No, I, don't, I never thought it was manned. Never. Right. I mean, when we say um, drone, we don't necessarily mean built human-made drone, but a drone, if an ET drone, maybe as well as an option. But yeah. a, mecha- um, a mechanical device that didn't have a pilot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you see, even the technology from then, and there's so many examples of it, it can't be replicated today. I mean, aircraft. There's certain things aircraft got to have to fly. I mean, they got to have Arions, they got to have, you know, flaps, they got to have intakes, they got to have exhausts, uh, uh, they got to displace air, they got to make noise. I mean, uh, I mean, there's so many things, even the air displacement when it takes off, I mean, there's sonic boom, booms. I mean, how do you not have a sonic boom from something that takes off at a, a speed of a 30-odd six round, you know, 3,000 miles an hour? How do you do that? I mean, the technology was pretty advanced. It's so advanced it, it can't be replicated. Yeah. And uh, uh, even though they're trying, you can see they're trying to do it. <laughs> but they're, uh, they're, they're a long ways from it. I mean, just take the, uh, the part about the uh, craft was on legs, but not a landing gear. They were light protruded, came down. Yeah, and I used the term one, light. Yeah. It's I used the term light. <laughs> yeah, I'm using the term light because it's uh, it's it's the easiest way for a 21st century man to explain it. Light. Is it light? Obviously not. It held up an object. <laughs> it held up an object and it made impressions of the ground. Okay. I mean, so it wasn't light. It was a technology that was unknown. 
Do we have that today? No. <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah. And and, uh, and turning back. And that's the other. Yeah, I'm gonna bring that up. Going back to John Brawls. Mm -hmm. After we came back in and that we went back out, he's the one that found the uh, impressions of the ground, not me. I didn't need to see him. Okay. I, <laughs> I said, he kept saying, come over and look at this. I said, no, I don't want to go over there. He says, come over and look at this. And finally, you know, because he was nagging me, I went back over and says, okay. And it was like, I should have known then because says, there's impressions in the ground. And I'm thinking, yeah. I don't understand. I, I was confused why he was so impressed by impressions in the ground. <laughs> you know? I mean, it turns out later after the team from Langley came in, uh, with the air temperature and ground temperature from that night, they could measure it, and they said that the, the craft, it was very light. It only weighed seven tons, and that is light for an aircraft, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but it the, made that. That was, from the, that was from the impressions in the cell. So they could tell the weight. Right. Okay. Right. Those are things that, you know, came out afterwards and after action reports and stuff like that, so... Um, and, and, you know, stuff like that was shared, you know, from the base commander and, and you know, the deputy, um, Colonel Hall. And, yeah, I mean, uh, I got to talk to uh, uh, General Williams after he retired uh, not long, not too long ago. So maybe uh, uh, 2013, 14, something like that. And, uh, I mean, actually, I met him out in Tucson. We had lunch and. Uh, Burroughs was there too and uh, you know he was uh, quite open about it um, he was even then he was uh, uh, only when Burroughs would leave to go to the bathroom or something like that he would ask me further questions he would only ask me certain questions when, you know uh, when I was alone he wouldn't do it in front of anybody else mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, which I was fine. And then, of course, in, in the course of writing the book, uh, I just told him I'm going to write a book. And uh, because the other one we did, I wasn't satisfied with it. didn't tell enough. Uh, it was too, uh, they were too worried about monetary things, okay, and what's sold and shit like that. <laughs> who, who cares? You know, I, I don't understand that part. And um, so, uh you know, he, he we worked back and forth. Unfortunately, his eyesight was really bad. Uh, and so uh, most of it was during emails and stuff like that. But sometimes on the phone we'd talk. And, you know, he uh, supported me all the way through it. And unfortunately, he died about a year before the book came out, a year and a half. Uh, uh, terrible loss. And um, But Colonel Conrad, he, he assisted us too, right up to and Colonel Conrad is is fine right now, uh, alive and well. And he helped uh, us to go right up through, um, you know, the, the publishing of the book. Uh, matter of fact, uh, uh, Monroe Neville's chapter that he wrote in there, uh, that was reviewed by uh, Colonel Conrad, and he stood behind it 100%. Okay. He says, 100% accurate. He goes, go with it. Uh, I have to say, Jim, that this is this is so refreshing to hear this because actually hearing you talking about this is giving me a, a, a brand new impression of of the military and intelligence community that I haven't had before, and that's of a, a, a getting an overwhelming sense of integrity uh, and support from from some of your CEOs, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the fact that actually. What I'm picking up from here more than anything else is, is something I've never had ever where this whole phenomenon is, is concerned, which is actually the motivation to try and go for containment wasn't driven by anything more than, first of all, many people were scared about the reaction that they would have to talking about this, but mm -hmm. also the fact that they just couldn't answer any questions about it. So, and, and that in itself would put them in a difficult position, which was nothing to do. It was not their fault at all. So uh, I yeah, have it, I, that's why I doubt anybody's story when they say they, they weren't supported by the military. <laughs> okay, that's, that, that I, really I doubt is. it because I'm gonna tell you what, in, 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 I can't remember what chapter it is, but Joseph will tell you. Um, it's uh, the one with Colonel Highbush. 
Mm-hmm. The, the, he's the base commander that base commander. He, he wasn't the base commander, but he, he probably wanted to be, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> he, um, he replaced Mel, uh, Major Zickler after the uh, the incident. That that should be clue you in right there. A full colonel f- from or a colonel from the uh, uh, Pentagon. That's where he worked. Is assigned now to take over as uh, major take over from uh, Major Zickler after this incident. And the first two days, within the first two days, I was working on plans and programs. And I mean, uh, you know, we wrote the plans, security plans for that and all kinds of stuff. And um, so it was like a day or he'd been there a day or two. And my boss gets a call and he says, hey, the squadron commander wants to see you up at the office. I said, oh, he probably wants a briefing, you know, da, 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 you know, <laughs> some of these plans. <laughs> we had plans for everything, okay? Um, and he says, well, he said, I take up this one here and I take up this other one. I said, okay. I says, that sounds good. And so I go up there and he says, I go on in there and I go to report, you know, and while I'm holding those books and he says, oh, no, no, no. He says, okay. He says, uh, he says hi. He said, I'm, Ch- I'm Chuck Highbush. I says, uh, okay, I'm Jim Peniston. You know, I'm like, what? what is this? And he says, uh, he went over, he shut all the doors, and he hollered to the lieutenant out there. He says, bring in two cups of coffee, please. And the guy did, and he says, sit down. He says, I want you to know, he says, I read your statement at the Pentagon on Reynolds. I says, really? He goes, yeah. I says, well... I says, you mean like the four-page one? He goes, yes. And I said, okay. He says, I want you to know if you have any questions, if you have any uh, problems, I'm here to help. You can always come to me. And he was that way. Even after he left the base, I still seen him. And he still checked up all the way uh, we were in for the remaining amount of time. Uh, so... To say the Air Force didn't care, <laughs> they made sure that I had someone that I could go to and yeah. someone I could talk to about it if there's a problem came up. Yeah. So and so if anybody says they don't have any that they don't trust anything with the military and they try to I I got some really high suspicions about that when they say that kind of stuff. They don't have the support, you know. And uh well, the, just to fill you in, Jim, the, 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 in the local area, there was a lot of Chinese whispers in the local community about the whole incident. And one of the main uh, uh, pieces, one of, one of the biggest Chinese whispers that was going around that fueled information being gossiped about was the fact that they, the local people were under the impression that all the people in the patrol that you were in were told not to talk about it and disbanded to different parts of the world, which is obviously, by the sounds of things, not true at all. So, that's well, if you said treat it as top secret, uh, no, some people didn't have access anymore. And I'll tell you what, it was a problem for me. I don't know if I put it in the book or not, but one of the problems was is the guys I worked with. The guys that were working with me that night that were at Woodbridge in Bentwaters, you know, uh, after they said you don't treat it as top secret, and you know they say, "What what happened?" I said, "I can't. I got to treat it as top secret." And they go, "Oh shit, really?" And I go, "Yeah." And everybody's like, "Bummer," you know, because they wanted to know too. They had questions. They had different vantage points tonight than, than I did. Like I never seen a land. Uh, the people at uh, working security patrol over at Bentwaters, uh, Sergeant Hall, and they seen a land. They couldn't figure out what the hell that was. They it was controlled landing. Then uh, we had people that are working in Annapolis, non, uh, uh, the aircraft parking areas at Woodbridge, and they were like, okay, we see it take off. Holy shit, you know. <laughs> they said, you can't talk about it. Like, Not no more. I said, they, they classified it to, you know, top secret. And they go, okay. And that's what we had to do. And, but that killed me not to say anything. And matter of fact, when we were writing this book, so many questions came in thing, uh, through, you know, the, the Internet, you know, with Facebook and those social groups. 
uh, the people that were there that night, I say, hey, if you got any questions, you got anything you think I should be brought up, be brought up or anything, you know, if you want me to bring it up, do it to kind of use your name. All of them said no names. <laughs> Nobody wants their names. I said, I fully understand that. And oh, a couple of people did. There was a couple of people, but uh, which I was okay with. And they're, uh, they're great people for letting me do that. And uh, oh, Bertolino, for example, he 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 let me use his name. Um, was he key? Yeah, he was a witness. We we're all witnesses, you know. Um, you know, then for you know, he was there on the on the transport back uh, with me uh, uh, to CSC after I came back in out of the field, and you know, and. He, he kept trying to talk to me. I mean, what and they know what I seen exactly. I, I'm I'm going over my notes so I can do that 1569 report up. You know, so by the time we got to CSC, and I said, Bert, I said, Bert, just, <laughs> I said, I'm busy, man. <laughs> I said, I'm busy. I said, I'm trying to get this stuff together. Okay, but in the book, yeah, he see me, you know, writing certain things down and like that, and but. That there's nothing unusual. I made every one of my guys have a notebook. I said, you're going to make sure you have correct times if anything happens. You're going to make sure you have correct names. You have notebooks. I made sure every one of my guys had notebooks. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's just the way it is. And you know what? It works. The other thing it made a little bit nicer to write a book, and it wasn't the reason <laughs> I actually did it, but every day I was in the Air Force, I kept uh, journals. Everything that happened during the day for 20 some years. That's a lot of journals, I yeah. want to tell you. And uh, I would use them, you know, to, for like maybe uh, we're going to do a base security council meeting. And I could go to the, the Colonel Williams and say, Colonel Williams, here's what happened at the last one. And here's what the deputy base or the deputy commander of maintenance says he was going to do this. He goes, what is that? I said, this is your cheat sheet. I said, it's to hold them all accountable from last year's meeting. Mm -hmm. Colonel Williams says, thank you very much, Sarge. <laughs> I mean, and they thought he was, they thought the Colonel was brilliant at those meetings. He go, wait, 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 you didn't say that last year. Here's what you said. You said this. And they were just like, oh man, the old man, he, he remembers everything. See, made him look good. And that's the whole thing about the military. You want to make your boss look good. So in, in terms you know, of taking notes, did you also, it seems like you also took photos with the camera. Was that right? You had some sort of yeah, thing. I did, but um, none of those turned out. Uh, really? And I thought, yeah, and I thought that whether well, white it out. And uh, when we got them, you know, done, and I thought something happened because of the base photo lab and that. But then I found out years later, from Monroe Nevels, whose hobby is a photography, he took his own pictures and developed his own pictures, and his were whited out too. Okay. And I said, "Well, how in the hell can that be, Monroe?" He strange. says, "He says radiation, possibly. That's what yeah. causes it. No, he said beta radiation. Oh, yeah. Monroe Nevels says it's beta radiation. That's what it is. Yeah, he was an expert. Right. He's an expert on it. That's why he was out there investigating it." Uh, yeah, so I says, "Oh, that makes sense." Uh, so, so, what kind of camera I, was it? Uh, is it quite an old the, um, one that you no, developed? It, you know, those, uh, uh, Maduro's cameras. You'd have to ask him, but I know that there'd be high-end uh, film kind. Okay. The 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 one I had out there was uh, uh, mainly for aircraft crashes, da, and uh, you know, uh, taking pictures of uh, people trying to take our record our tail numbers or our planes and stuff and suspicious activity. Um, it was a Canon, I think A1, A1, I think it's what it is. I could be wrong about that. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. We, uh, I only had black and white film anyway. That's all you have in it. Mm. You I'd, I'd love to see one of those pictures, but <laughs> unfortunately they're all white. So. There's no, nothing yeah, there. no impression. Well, there. see, but there's some other ones that were taken, you know, uh, that were farther away, and of course, the daylight hours. I think that one of those is has been publicized. I mean, it shows the indentions and stuff like that. 
Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, but the funny thing is, is that uh, even the following day, uh, when Monroe was out there investigating it, the actual landing site, which isn't that big, I mean, it was probably about five feet by six feet, seven feet, something like that. It was very big. Uh, was still registering beta radi radiation, which normally doesn't it doesn't last that long unless there's a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And that's what ran up the trees too, where it, where it took off. You know. Mm -hmm. um, um, now, like Monroe said, the good thing is it wasn't gamma. He you know, says, "Why is that?" And he's, and Monroe said, "Well, we want none of us to be here. It was gamma ray." <laughs> so okay, he says, "But that's why you had a sense of touch. It was warm to touch." He says, "Yeah." He says, "That's part of it." I said, okay. So, you know, through the years, we uh, we sort of sussed these things out. We figured them out, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, some are just very logical conclusions. Some are hypothesis. <laughs> uh, I make sure that you guys know whether or not it is a fact or not, because I think there's enough of that disinformation going on from everybody out there. Uh, I don't know. Hey, that's the other thing. They're all trying to make money off this. Yeah. That's what it is. Uh, I have never made money off Reynoldson. I, I, there's no way in the world I would have thought that that was a good idea. Okay, because I I looked at it as the thing happening around Christmas is probably a gift to begin with, the information, and uh, so uh, my honorariums, all the book proceeds, my portions of that. Uh, they go to charity, and I have some great charities uh, that I give. Uh, uh, so that's not my motivation. <laughs> okay, yeah. it's not for uh, you know three seconds of fame or something like that either. I, I'm actually a pretty private person, and uh, uh, I usually only go out when I start hearing. I get tired of hearing too much disinformation about Rendlesham, and then I start talking about it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise. Uh, I've been pretty quiet about it. Yeah. Well, it's it's only through you know really brave former uh, service men and women being being prepared to come forward and and tell their story that you know we can start to get a clearer picture and try and understand, and and it contributes to quality research. <clears throat> I mean, I have to say that that you know it's it's to a degree I'm starting to understand the thinking that's gone into things like the, the containment around this and. You know the the attempts to try and stifle it. Um, I mean, there's no. I think the the some of the the noises that have been coming out of of uh, declassified bits and pieces of information now, and certainly uh, what some senators are saying, there was a, a general question mark. I think that's coming out that, and and this has probably been the same for the past 50, 60 years. Would the public really be able to cope with this information? I mean, if, if, even if your story had come out in 1980, would that have been a, a, a positive thing, do you think, or, or would it have, have, have scared a lot of people? Uh, I don't think it's about that. Uh, yeah. it's, about, it's about power. Right, okay. Uh, the technology is power, okay? Um, do you have... Access to that technology and understand how to use that technology is power, and that's what it's all about. Uh, so they, they don't care about if you guys, if people are upset over UFOs, or <laughs> they don't care about that. Uh, another thing that you got to be really be careful about on this, James, is just because it comes from the government doesn't mean it's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay, there is so many false flags going on right now. It's ridiculous, and Congress is one of them. That's a false flag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that whole thing with the, the they're going to release information and all these secret things, and that's that's a false flag pro uh, operation. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yeah. Look over here, not here. Okay. Look over <laughs> here, not here. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you seem well versed at versed in all this, <laughs> definitely. No, I know. Uh, you know what? We sit there, we talk about this. Uh, 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 the other people are involved, by the way that I talked to, um, and, you know, oh, yeah, it's false flag. I mean, M Monroe and I, uh, we were talking about the, the, the in particular, the uh, 
the release for the Congress. I don't know what their motivation is, but it has nothing to do with UFOs, all right? <laughs> it's a false flag. It keeps people quiet. It gets votes. I don't know what it does, okay? It's, um, who knows? Yeah, um, um, I don't, a, yeah. a whole different story yeah, and, than what's going on. Yeah, I don't believe time. everything that comes out of the Pentagon. I, you know, I don't... Don't believe that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it begs the question, if there's so many false flags going on and, and, you know, people with integrity like yourself are able to come forward and tell their story and tell the truth, how on earth are we ever going to evolve as a race when all this crap is going on? <laughs> it begs belief. Well, I, unfortunately, I think it's all about power and control. So yeah, I agree. And I, I don't know if uh, – we haven't done well for the last 4,000 years, so – it's been about power and control for 4,000 years. Uh, I don't think it's going to change, not in the near future anyway, you know. It's, uh, I know it's horrible. I agree with you, James. Uh, it's not a good situation yeah. at all. If I, if I can ask you, because Joe's got some, some really um, r- really good questions come up, but just uh, one more from me before he, he cracks. You ask all you want, James. <laughs> oh, thank, you. thank you very much. Who do you think... Uh, in your opinion, I mean, having having obviously been looking at this for years, who do you think is behind uh, the, the 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 major decisions to to go move towards containment uh, and covering this up? Well, it's not it's not a, it's not in the like sitting in the Pentagon. Okay, it's not there. It's not. I I tell you what, um, it goes to classifications. Um, presidents come and go, so do members of Congress, okay? And I'm going to talk about the U.S., and I don't think it's any better in the U.K., okay? They right. come and go, uh, some more often than others, <laughs> but they, you know, it's, it's happening all the time. So what they do in America, to, and the Brits do the same thing, by, by the way. They just have different ways of doing it, but they do the same thing. Official Seekers Act, that's the beginning of it. Uh but in America, the uh, what they what what they do with the classification system is that uh, we have the Freedom of Information Act, okay, FOIA requests and that you yeah. get stuff. But the way to do it is what they do is they go ahead and fund. Let's say the Pentagon, they they create a department, give it fifty million dollars in the Pentagon, and their investigation is anomalies, space anomalies. Uh, unknown space anomalies, okay? That's what their job is. Okay, then what they do, uh, that, that, that is probably a top secret program, okay? And then what they do is they go ahead and subcontract it out to civilians, okay? And, what they, and that's a special, what they have under where the money is showing, it's going, is a special operations, a special access program. Mm-hmm. But then they go ahead and fund it out to contractors, civilians, and what those are are not special access programs, but they are uh, uh, unknown special access programs, okay? Meaning, uh, and that's not the correct term. It's another word to use in there. And um, what that means is if you did a FOIA request, I don't care if you're a member of Congress, I don't care if you're president of the United States, you would not find the answer. There would be no answer. There would be no paper trail for it, okay? You all know what those civilians were doing in this agency. That's where these people come up with the name Black Departments. Yeah, that's how it happens, okay? And there's those things happening all the time. They're happening right now as we talk. Um, and that's where the control is actually being, I think, done at there. Uh, uh, but to say that uh, there's a department within the U.S. government that does these kind of things, no, 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 no. Well, it, it's, no. It, there's, there's two governments, as, as people say. There's, a, there's the government that we kind of associate with, and there's just kind of one behind the scenes, which is, as you say, maybe born out of this, these special access programs that seem to have had. Well, there, yeah, there's a shadow. The there's a. Yeah, there's a shadow government. Sure, there is. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a government within the government. There, yeah, <laughs> I, I I think so there. But when you start developing stuff, one of the um, and one of the and that's where this Kit Green King thing came in, and um, 
he's worked for Bigelow uh, Aerospace uh, when he contacted me again in what, 2014, 15. And uh, he, he, you know, he's telling all kinds of stuff, you know, what they want to do. It's about power. They want to, they want to, they want to, they want to know what the, the reason they were talking to me and they were also talking to John. And I thought they wanted me to, uh, they told me, he says, here's what Kit Green says. He says, if you cooperate, he said, we'll guarantee you. He said, I'll get, make sure this happens. You will have a hundred percent disability and collect a check from the VA. I'm thinking, well, I'm retired Air Force. I don't really need a check, you know, because you can't double dip anyway, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and I went, okay, so how are you going to do this? He said, well, we says we have doctors. We'll just say that this situation happened with you and this. And I says, no. I says, there's no way I can do that. I says, when we actually have people coming back from with traumatic head injuries and missing body parts, uh, to scam the VA, I wouldn't do that. That came from Kit Green. Okay, so I'm just going to do it. There's yeah. some other people that, that pres- did participate, though. <laughs> and I will leave that nameless. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sure. Um, I wonder if you could turn back to um, the craft. And uh, you, you, men- you mentioned that it was uh, warm to touch um, the field it was generating. But um, you also said in the book that it had these uh, weird hieroglyphs on it. Yeah, externally, um, that was one of the uh, first things I noticed as we, you know, I did the walk around. Uh, uh, The craft itself, uh, I used to turn black glass because it was dark. It felt that smooth. But there's no doubt about it. It was was some kind of metal, okay? I mean, it wasn't glass. And so I went from touching the um, craft itself and when I got to the glyphs they were like etched into the side of the craft and I used the comparison to make it easy for people to understand it felt like going from a smooth black glass to like sandpaper that's kind of etching and these glyphs were uh, I didn't have nothing to measure out there it was just were me the glyphs sort of proud of the glass or were they kind of at the same level Etching, etching is uh, is the best. Uh, it was so it's etching above the it's level. Above, okay. uh, yeah, just, uh, maybe fractionally, you know. Yeah, and uh, uh, you, when you touched them, he said that you were get you received this code. We can come on to the code in a bit more detail. But you, you, how you described it? Were you sort of paralyzed at the time when you received the code, or were you kind of in control of your movements? And- well, when I when I touched the you know the uh, the bigger one, which was the triangular yeah. uh, glyph, I mean, <clears throat> I mean this the forest was pitch black except for the area where that craft was. It was sort of lit up, and uh, when I touched it, I mean, I it was just a brilliant light, uh, uh, and I could see anything else. And that's when I seen the you know the the ones and zeros, which mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Is, is doesn't mean nothing to me at the time. It was insanity or something. I don't know what it was. It's crazy, and um, I was stunned, I guess. Uh, and I just sort of had uh, got my senses back, and uh, I just lifted my hand off, and it stopped. Now I used the term light again for that blinding white light Mm -hmm. it obviously wasn't light and here's a fact why it wasn't a light because after taking my hand off i had 100 percent of my night vision and there's no way on this earth you could have that kind of bright bright light and not it take it take you 45 minutes to another hour to get your night vision back i had it immediately so, so your, your your eyesight felt like it was just before you no know, hadn't changed in terms of how you could see the, the the world around you. Right. Yeah. It was just uh so uh that's why I can I've I've come to the conclusion that it was a transmission. Yeah. Okay. Uh I don't want you to think I'm just guessing or something like that. I mean it was the night vision is probably the biggest clue 
there's no way that you can have your full night vision after being blinded by this this, this light. Yeah. I couldn't see nothing. <laughs> it was bad. So, so you received this transmission, and um, you say that uh, was it on the, on that night you couldn't sleep until you wrote this down into your into your notebook. You have... well, the following day, you know, when we got off work. I mean, I was uh, I was pretty keyed up. I went back out there. We got plaster of Paris. We did this stuff. And, oh yeah, yeah. <sighs> it was a busy day, you know, but I. I wanted to be busy, okay. And um, anyway, so finally it gets around night nighttime that night, and I want to. I know I'm tired, or very tired, and I said I gotta go to sleep. And, um, I was having trouble trying to get to sleep because when I kept seeing these ones and zeros, I said, "Oh, every time I close my eyes, what the hell is this?" And I was really concerned because I was concerned about the trauma from the event because uh, I thought I was losing it, actually. And um, and that's pretty much it. I couldn't go and, like, call up the base hospital and go up there and try to explain, even begin to explain what what happened that day day before. Mm -hmm. uh, Anyway, I was pretty concerned about it. So I got up and I couldn't sleep anyway, so I made a pot of coffee. Uh, I don't know, it was like midnight. Uh, I pulled out my notebook because I wanted to go ahead and look over some of the stuff I read, you know, wrote down and stuff in there. Uh, and I says, you know, I think I can, I think I can write, that, write those down. So I just flipped to some open pages in the back and I started writing, you know, the zero, zero, one, 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 zero. And the thing is, when I was doing that, it felt good. I went, oh, so I just kept writing. As a matter of fact, at a certain point, my pen jammed. I mean, it was the ink clouded up and I couldn't write anymore. So I'm like panicking, going through the drawer, trying to find a pen that works. And I went back to it, and I started writing again. And I wrote them all out, uh, 16 pages. Um, and uh, I wrote them all out. And when I got to one point, it was like, I don't see them anymore, and I feel good. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you thought, can't see them now, if you try to imagine them. Could you see them now, do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. but, yeah but it's not, uh, it's not the same. It's not the same, no, okay. no, it's not the same. Uh, okay. No, that was pretty. That was pretty intense. I, I was just. Uh, yeah, imagine. Yeah, I don't. Uh, good question, uh, but it was pretty intense. Yeah, it's not the same though. But can I? Yeah, yeah, but uh, it's not the same. What kept you from um, sharing that for so many years? Because I thought it, I, I thought it was a, a mental breakdown. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and that's the last thing I'm gonna do for the remaining time I got in the Air Force. And I tell you what, it's just really by uh, chance after I got out, by going in there for a sleep disorder, that the hypnosis was even done. And it wasn't for that. Um, see, I think the Achilles heel with the investigators on this at the OSI and whoever those other people were is that they didn't know I had a notebook. They didn't know I had written the, you know, the binary down. Uh, I think that's their Achilles heel on it. Uh, as far as knowing that if it was important, I didn't think it was important. Uh, after what I seen that night, nothing was important, you know, other than what you experienced. And then uh, we're doing a film shoot down in Flor- uh, Florida, uh, in Phoenix. And, uh, I can't remember when, 10, 2010, something like that. And I had taken them all out at one time, <coughs> but I had replaced them back in. They're all loose, in a loose, loose leaf. And I had the film shoot down in Phoenix, and that was a uh, how. Linda Howe, uh, 
and uh, Burroughs and oh, it was for Ancient Aliens. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and they were using film then. It wasn't it wasn't digital. And uh, they asked, uh, oh, John asked me about a date, about time. And uh, I said, I don't know, maybe I got it written down. Because I, I recorded all kinds of stuff, you know, like a meeting at the pub and stuff like that. And uh, I'm looking through it, and I went back too far. And, you know, of course, all the ones and zeros are there. And he goes, what's that? Uh, I'm thinking, hmm, well, Oh, what the hell? I'm out of the Air Force now. I'll tell him what the hell. I, I'll tell him about this. And I didn't even get a chance to tell him about. It. I said, "Well, I just said that I, I wrote. I wrote them down that you know the night I, we got back in." And Howell says, "We well, you know what that is." And I told him, "Yeah, it's like insanity." <laughs> she said, "That's binary code." I went binary code. Hmm. That's when I found out it was binary code. I didn't know anything about. And then they, you know, everybody was like, you know, there was had saliva coming down their mouth, you know, over the stuff. Okay, it was crazy, and uh, it was. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, of course, it's insanity, right? Well, I mean, I, that's what it is. So it means something. We're gonna get decoded. I, said, I, don't and know I guess they're that. thinking this is a message from some extraterrestrial civilization. I, I guess I don't know. Yeah, they've been drinking Kool Aid too long. You know what I mean? <laughs> that Kool Aid. And uh, and anyway, I I went home and back to Chicago area, and uh, man, Hall was bothering me every day on the phone. Every day she was bothering about that, and. Uh, Burroughs was no better and uh, anyway so I get a call from the ancient aliens uh, the, um, uh, Kim Sharon and she says uh, we want to go ahead and have that checked out I said Kim I says it's, <laughs> it was this trauma man I said there ain't nothing there and she goes oh, just let us try it and you know if it is it is we'll keep it to ourselves and I said okay so I don't know, I sent her like five or six pages. I can't remember where I sent her five pages, I think. And uh, then uh, she gets hold of me like two days later. She is excited. Um, she made me come up on the internet so, so I could view it. I'm not sure it was. We didn't have the social media like we have today. It was some other thing they had. <clears throat> and she told me, uh, you know, this is the message. And they had a message on there, you know, yeah. coordinates and all this stuff. And um, not, not, you know, it was a message. It, they, <clears throat> and I, so I said, you know what? I says, okay. I said, let's keep it quiet for now. And so I um, photocopied five pages, uh, scanned them, and I sent them to how <clears throat> it shut her up to. She said, oh, I'll have an investigator, so i go for it. Because I don't think it, I don't know, I thought maybe ancient aliens was pulling something. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I wasn't sure. And um, she gets a hold of some, <coughs> some guy down in, uh, a doctor down in Australia, and there's another one over in the UK, uh, not in the UK, but uh, North Carolina. And they do a decipher on it. And so she calls me excited like four days later. Guess what? I said, just tell me what you think it says. And she read exactly what ancient aliens said. And, it says, and then I told her, I said, oh. I said, oh. She said, well, you don't seem very excited. Well, I'm a little bit relieved, I says, but um, no, I'm not, I'm not excited. I says, I just, I, I said, but it's good to know ancient aliens wasn't pulling my leg. Huh? She says they they already had this code and they deciphered it. I go yeah, and she was pissed. I don't know why she was so pissed. Uh, you'd think the more people that looked at it, the better. I don't know. Um, wow. But that just tells you people have their own motivations. Sure. See? But what what's strange about this code and uh, just to give it a bit of context. It's it gives um, messages. It's got. Uh, words in there and it's also at coordinates what what seems strange about it is it seems to be like a piece a puzzle piece in a jigsaw not some it clear is. message and and also it's done using a coordinate system that the way using it's 
using English as a language, which which you you speak. Um, it's and, and I speak obviously. It's what why why is this craft unless it was deliberately put there for this message to come to you? It seems very odd that the message had been done in well, binary to using a binary code system as well that we would translate into the words we had. It's 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 a puzzle. And it's in, in, in so many ways. <laughs> oh, is this this excellent questions? Uh, did you see the uh, work I sent you uh, from Gary Osborne? Yeah, if I, I looked through that and I've seen the, his interpretations with including the phi, the the golden, um, the sorry, not code the, itself, um, the fine structure the constant, the, the, the it, fine it, structure it, constant. Yeah. But the only time that's valid was that December nineteen eighty. Mm -hmm. The way yeah, the words I mean, were on the planet. I, I'm going to try are, and, and try and speak. And then, to Gary and then the other thing, and, make and, <laughs> and then the other thing, they didn't have the technology until only a couple of years ago to actually uh, understand that, that they had to find structure constant and stuff from 1980 in there. So it's it's proof positive that the code is legit. I mean, it came from some intelligent intelligence yeah. somewhere. Okay, the fine structure constant constant is, uh, you know, to get to get something moved over to the chance of uh, you know twelve or thirteen zeros. This is you know chance of it being just arbitrary. I think what's made up prior to you receiving the code. I think there was a message. I think it was Carl Sagan said that if we ever find a message. And it has the um, the fine structure constant in it, embedded in it. That will be clue to an advanced civilization. And then, lo and behold, that was part of it. And it, that's that's his interpretation of showing that it's almost like a response from what we were saying. They were like listening to us and saying, "Well, so they want the fine structure constant in a message. Here, here you go." And but somehow it was um, orchestrated in such a way that you wouldn't be able to. Interpret it to later, but then you but the the fine structure contract was from 1980. Yeah, so so the only way to play here. <laughs> well, so that means whatever intelligence is knows what was going to happen from 1980 to 2019. <laughs> I mean, how do they do that, Jim? If I can ask you this, and this this is all linked to the the central hypothesis. How many nuclear weapons were on the on the base when you were you were working there, or in the area? A lot. More than twenty. Oh, uh, I don't know exactly. Right. I really don't. Uh, all I know is that we had uh, we had them. Uh, I don't know. They weren't the right ones anyway. We couldn't use them anyway. They were for a different aircraft. No, but if if you know if the DEFCON rating had changed significantly, and obviously this was around the time of the Cold War, had had things escalated, how quickly would that base have been able to get onto a sort of you know? The weapons were useless for uh, any aircraft we had. So they'd have they, to have flown flown an aircraft in and deploy them through a different aircraft somewhere but that, else. Mm -hmm. But that potentially could have happened within what 24, 48 hours. It can it can happen real fast. <laughs> yes. was, that, was that the closest U.S. base to Russia at the time that had weapons on it like that? Well, I'm not, I, I'm not prepared to answer that. No, sure, uh, sure. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, yeah, you, I don't want to do that. But it's going to be it's going to be one it's going to be uh, probably one of the closest in terms of a, 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 a close. Well, it's close closer than the missile field in Montana. I mean, yeah, yeah I mean. Uh, uh, so, just, you know, we also have our, our you know, U.S. Navy uh, submarines and everything else. They're all over the world. You know, so I, so I, I wasn't been trying to avoid it, but, yeah, it's avoided. I don't know really the answer to that because, uh, you know, you could have a subs in the North Sea. I don't know. But, you know? but equally, the, the, I suppose the point I'm trying to get to here is if we are working to the, the hypothesis that these were time travelers, did this one event involving you change the course of history? 
Because if that base had been able to go from, you know, the weapons were useless unless they, they flew in a, you know, a massive bomber or whatever else, then that base could have had a huge significance had there been a third world war and a nuclear conflict. Uh, well, it, it, was, it was significant. It was the largest tactical fighter wing in the world. <laughs> it's huge. We had a, and I tell you what, <clears throat> its mission was to go ahead and stop 5,000 tanks, 5,000 tanks from crossing a point in Germany. Um, and those A-10s would have went and took them out. Okay. So that, that was their job. We also had forward 8 to 10 bases uh, in Germany that belonged to us uh, at four different locations that would fly out, and they would stop that. It was for a conventional war. Uh, so uh, so had whether, whether the war had been, uh, you know, a, a nuclear conflict or a conventional war, it was of huge strategic significance. Yes, yes. It was it was a pivoted base, a pivoting base in uh, Europe. Um, uh, I know one thing: uh, uh, they would uh, the Warsaw Pact countries and Soviet Union would love to have that those two bases gone, <laughs> non-existence. I mean, that would made it a lot easier. I mean, the, the, the time frames here because everybody associates the end of the Cold War with the the summit between Reagan and Gorbachev that took place in Iceland. Do you remember that? Right. Yeah. And that was, how how long uh, was that? I can't remember the time frame. Was that Christmas 1980 or the following year, 1981? Well, I think it was about a year after that he got in there. I know he was dealing with the Iranian hostages the first thing he did. That's the first thing he did, January 20th of 81. Uh, yeah. he, he got them released. And uh, I know that... Uh, uh, Reagan had uh, the Soviets scared to death of uh, 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 of their um, the space shield, uh, you know, that they're going to yeah, talk Star about making Star Star Wars. Wars. Yes, yeah. uh, which, by the way, is still probably the best bet to protect all our countries. Is a is that concept a yeah. bubble over each country? You, yeah. you bring up mm -hmm. interesting points there, and then you mentioned about time travelers, and I, I did want to know if you thought that maybe this was future humans as opposed to extraterrestrials. Well, the evidence points, together. the evidence points to it, and uh, we talk, okay, what evidence is there? Well, uh, why would they have a aircraft or a craft marked like we mark our aircraft? Mm -hmm. We put tail numbers on. All of us do. We we mark our aircraft. They they definitely marked theirs. The one in the forest that night was marked. It had glyphs on it. Why mark it? Mm -hmm. And also no, the message itself at the end it says eighty one hundred. Yes, that could be a reference to a future date, or could that be something completely different? Uh we went back and forth. The people that've been researching that. Half of them say yes, and the other half say no. Yeah, so they don't know, I guess. Uh, I know one thing that um, uh, the discoveries that it's producing from the code are um, pretty much mind-boggling. That's according to Gary. Uh, he He's working with other doctors with this, other scientists. Um, and uh, I sent I, – I don't, I don't want to say stuff – and make it and say something wrong, okay? Because it's I'm, I get a little lost with it. Uh, but the evidence that he's shown me and has talked to me about is, uh, you know, this is just like proof positive. There's no doubt about it uh, that these are definitely some type of uh, people that have uh, uh, the capability of, uh, of of interdimensional travel. That's really what we're talking about. Time travel is Hollywood. Interdimensional travels, what we're talking yeah. about, and then the term uh, extra tempestual is getting coined as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Doc, uh, what's his name from Montana? What's his name? Is it Masters? He, he, Masters, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 brilliant guy, too. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, so, so uh, that, that that seems like that's probably the case. 
Um, the thing is, is that uh, uh, it's that the, in fact that the, there are certain things that weren't known until certain dates. I mean, it just wasn't known uh, with the code. Um, and the so, code does point to the idea that for us to proceed, uh, uh, for humanity to proceed, it has to um, take seriously a lot of the hidden truths around like the, the, the pyramids of Giza and various other things. Um, it seems that there's there's things for us to discover as humanity if we want to progress. Um, yeah. I guess to get to where they are, if it is future humans, is it? Yeah, and uh, some of the discoveries that they've had over the last five, six years out of, out of Giza, uh, we already knew about because of the code. And uh, it was like, well, this is saying that this is where this is at. This is what's going on here. And this is where a, a possible chamber is. And all of a sudden now they're like confirming everything that was, you know, thought or we knew from the code before. Uh, so there must be a uh, wealth of knowledge waiting for us somewhere in mm -hmm. uh, at yeah. Giza. Uh, uh, so whether that, that's interesting, because as far as disclosure, that's how disclosure will happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It'll be through that kind of, through the evidence. Not, yeah. And uh, yeah. Graham Hancock's just brought out a series on Netflix about all these things, and I think it's gaining... There's a lot of people viewing it. So, yeah, as you say, I think it's things like that that will be more um, more relevant to disclosure than the I agree. Show, um, you know, report or whatever from government. Yeah, I um, agree. I agree. I, I just but the thing is, I just uh, there's I don't agree in the, with the alien uh, hypothesis. There's no evidence. Zero. <laughs> they have concluded that's what they are because that's what they think they are. Oh, uh, so therefore they are. No, <laughs> no. You can apply. You can apply interdimensional travel to all this. Every bit of them. Certainly, with the Rendlesham incident, but you know, the, with all the other incidents out there of UFOs and things, you know. Well, <laughs> and one of the other hypotheses that Gary came up with is is the uh, these grays and stuff like with grays. These are actually uh, manufactured biological units, according you know, it's his theory, and it's because. Uh, the craft, going back to James, the craft was unmanned. I didn't feel that it was big enough or uh, I didn't see any way it could have been manned. Uh, that these are units that are, are designed or manufactured with human what our DNA or whatever. And that's so they can survive the interdimensional travel. That's mm -hmm. his theory. Human, humans can't. We're, it's, just, it's just too much. We can't do it. That's probably why they sent back a uh, unmanned craft. <laughs> you know, it's just uh, they can't survive it. So, but they can send back messages. That was that's for sure. Um, they can send back things like that. So um, they've, they've effectively, if we if we start to to understand this, so there is a possibility here that that, that a craft of unknown origin human future human maybe not has been sent back has had a potentially a direct has achieved a direct effect of altering the course of history which would suggest that potentially the path we were on before december 1980 was potentially apocalyptic over the next four to five years so not only have they potentially changed history but they've also now given us information relating to certain potentially archaeological sites and information in there could be directly relevant to our evolution as a race. Nicely said. Thank you. <laughs> it is. Nicely said. Yes. So I, I think, I mean, that in itself. That's that's our conclusion, what we've come up with, too. But yeah. nicely said. We, do, we didn't use the same words. <laughs> but I'll tell you what. Nicely said. And uh, uh, that's what we, uh, my belief is on it. And so is Gary's. And uh well, this, so, this all fits. This all fits. I mean, the, the, you, you mentioned the work of Graham Hancock. Uh, there were a number of other authors as well that talked about the prospect of, of our finding. Uh, in, I think it was Edgar Case. Edgar Case, Edgar the, Edgar the Casey, famous, yeah, yeah uh, talks about the uncovery, uh, the you know, the uncovering of the the lost Hall of Records. 
and mm-hmm. asked finding out information relating to an advanced, this is fits in with Hancock's work about a super advanced civilization predating the Egyptians um, that may or may not have had an extraterrestrial influence. But the idea being that we became uh, more advanced at a much earlier age than current recorded history or ancient history states. Um, this is all, I mean, this is all so uh, incredible and exciting. But I think the, the thing that I, I seize on most, the thing that I find most inspiring about this whole, your whole journey, is that it suggests that um, there's a version of ourselves in the future that is very, is very keen to see us survive, make it, and evolve properly. Their, uh, lives, their lives depend on it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. They, they, they got, we have to do well. <laughs> yeah, we need to take, take the hint at this point. Well, that's, that's fascinating. I mean, I know for, for years there was a general frustration with the, um, the Board of Antiquities. I think this, is, this was certainly how Graham Hancock stated. There was a, a frustration with the Board of Antiquities at the, at the Giza Necropolis because there was a, a real feeling that they were deeply insulted by the fact that they, anyone could dare to suggest that a people other than the Egyptians had been responsible for building the pyramids. So there was always a traditionally a huge pushback uh, from, from the board, of, you know, from, from the uh, director of antiquities there. But, but uh, I, if, if they can, I mean, I, I'm aware, I've been aware of numerous attempts on the Giza Plateau to use technology that was developed for the, for the first Gulf War to scan for, um, you know, that was originally developed by planes to scan, you know, ground penetrating radar radar yeah. bunkers. And that they were they were a couple of guys with a military background that had done archaeology qualifications that were going up there to try and use this tech to try and see if they could find uh, any any unexcavated sites. And it, you know, by the looks of things, there are a couple there. Uh, if you get a chance, James, uh, take a look at what I sent Joseph. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm from Gary because he's got some charts in there, some diagrams. He is. They're brilliant, okay, and it really makes it a lot easier to understand when you start looking. You need a large screen TV to look at this stuff, though. But um, uh, I, I really didn't understand the uh, the how important the binary was until I looked at that. Mm. I and I was like, oh, I'm gonna watch that again. I mean, it's like you know, an hour and fifteen minutes long. And I was like, that's the best hour and fifteen minutes I ever spent. You know, so. Do you ever feel, do you ever feel, Jim, looking back on all the things you've been through, do you think there is a possibility that you were selected to have this experience and to receive that message? I think the evidence is pointing to that, okay? It's not a by chance situation. It's all precisely thought out. (laughs) I mean, as bizarre as that sounds, it's thought out. Um, You know, Gary and I were, you know, we, we talk and we, just around a few, to, you know, with stuff, and he says, "Jim, he says, you ever stop and think that maybe a copy of the Rendlesham Enigma survived eight thousand years somewhere, and maybe that's what why they knew when to come back." Yes, it's totally possible. <laughs> I mean, that's a nice thought. I mean, I was like, mm, okay, uh, that's a good hypothesis, but is it true? I don't know. You know, what survives? What survives in the future? I don't know. Something, you know, they, because they're really, they really have a nice roadmap because they know exactly from based on what's happened over the last 42 years, they they know exactly when stuff's happening. So it's, it's, it's bizarre. If only they could have given you the winning lottery numbers. <laughs> yes. Yeah, what's, what's wrong with that? Yeah. I mean, really. Maybe I better go ahead and just uh, pick two uh, numbers from all the binary and try it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you or even think- just a message like uh, your future is in danger unless you do X, Y, and Z, and uh, we are from the future. Um, hi, my name's Bob, and my friend is, <laughs> you know, you know, there's something like that. But no, it was um, it's very cryptic in a way, and that's that's. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, didn't try to. You know, I have things I can't wrap my hands around uh, at all on it. It's like, I mean, how can I sit there and write that down? And but maybe I think they've got it's a strong. limited amount of time to get a message to you. So you have to get 
they t- they've collect- selected this and this this and this coordinate said well, yeah but one of the things that bothers didn't... bothers me on this joseph is you know during the middle of writing that down i got up and i was trying to find another pen i stopped mm-hmm. and it, it still continued on where i left off how does that work i mean <laughs> yeah i got thousands of questions mm-hmm. yeah yeah, it's quite. Did you have you ever uh, think you've you've never seen these those type of hieroglyphs previous you know again after that? You've seen yeah. nothing on Earth. You have no. Uh, yeah, they they discovered some know, five ten years ago. Cerno um, Bruni, I guess uh, there is a um, uh, sighting in eighteen o three. Uh, that was just recently released. I mean, the last 10, 15 years, something like that. And uh, it has the same type of writing in it that was on the side of the craft, or at least in the same family. Okay, you say, oh, they're similar. Okay. Hmm. Uh, so there were other sightings, apparently, that according to the, that that incident that happened. Uh, I think that one mainly was a USO uh, uh uh, water type object uh, that was recorded, uh, but when the discovery of that really says, "Oh, yeah, they're definitely the same family." So it seems like they have reached out. I mean, somewhere. Of course, you know, if you have the ability for interdimensional interdimensional travel, uh, time travel. I mean, for them, everything could have you know only been done in the last week, eighteen oh three. Uh, 1980, <laughs> the building of the pyramids, you know, it was all done in a week. You know, who knows for them? Yeah. You know, it's uh, time is only a kind of, it's only a relative, you know, at the point in time. Uh, How it, would this... be, it would be interesting to see these hieroglyphs, you say, that are, are in separate cases. That would sort of corroborate everything and yeah. tie it all together, wouldn't it? Yeah. I, um, I think by web page has it i tell you what you go to there's a blog if you go to the rendlesham force incident yeah. dot com that's our, our new blog that darren is doing uh it has those in there okay but well, you can't miss it because you you yeah. see japanese or chinese looking people you know so you, you won't miss it but you look in on the one side that you say oh that looks like rendlesham stuff yeah mm-hmm uh yeah so um have have weird things happened to you since rendlesham do you think paranormal activity or anything that suggests that these things are carried on now has it all been (laughs) no nothing nothing has happened since or like that Uh, one time was enough uh so i'm okay with it uh i i i've talked to people and that that have incidents but uh, there's certain people I talk to, uh, you know, they only had the you know, the one incident, and that's uh, uh, the one that was uh, the Roswell, or not Roswell, but um, uh, the one that happened in Snowflake, Arizona, with the uh, Phoenix Lights, maybe, or no, um, like. I'm not sure which one what's which, which one it is his name either. I tell you what, I'm with this cold. I I got so much cold medicine in me. I'm my memory's like. <laughs> well, you didn't. You're doing fantastic to remember. From, yeah. from, to remember the story. So, appreciate that. Um, maybe uh, actually, I wouldn't mind asking. In the book, you talk about this memo that was sent to the MOD. Um, do you know if anything about that could be received from FOIA to? Or the equivalent in the UK to get access to that information is that something that could be we could get back? What what memo? A memo. I think you or Holt sent a memo of the incident to. Oh yeah, yeah. I think that's actually a. I think that's obtainable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was un- unclassified. And he sent. It, he actually did it for Third Air Force, uh, and I think I did a a courtesy copy for the squadron. Uh, squadron leader at um, at Bent Waters. I think that's what they did. That's how it went to the MOD. Okay. And, and do you know um, if there's any uh, radar data that's um, available that shows the craft in the area? I think you 
There was. Yeah. There was. Not anymore. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Disappeared. There was. (laughs) Well, yeah. I mean, it's the same place my statements and everything else are. You know, according to Colonel Highbush, anyway. Yeah. There there was two separate towers that showed this craft in the area. Is that right? But. Well, they actually they triangulated it because uh, they did uh, Heathrow radar, and then they did Eastern radar. I think that's Broad Sea. I'm not sure. I think it's already Broad Sea. I'm not sure. Um, and then, of course, we had the one that was running at the base, and that's what that's what they knew. There was a bogey, you know, 15 minutes prior, and that's that's actually gave us the authorization. Of, that an emergency situation existed because we lost contact with a uh, uh, aircraft, a probably military, because didn't have a transponder over the base 15 minutes prior to what was going on at the East Gate, and that gave us the authorization under the Status of Forces Agreement to have an emergency situation where the base commander authorized us to deploy off base. Otherwise, you wouldn't probably went off base. Everything was procedural. Yeah, <laughs> Everything. Yeah. I mean, it don't sound like it is, but when you when you explain it to me, it is all procedural. It was all we were all doing protocols. You know, mm-hmm. everything we we're following things by the book to a point. You know, uh, uh, up to the point when you know you couldn't follow the book anymore. Okay. Um, yeah. Has um, since the incident have people has anyone reached out to you maybe privately from other military bases that have said? Anything equivalent has happened, but they've kind of not made it public. Yes. Okay. There's a lot, quite a few actually. Okay. Uh, that's where uh, you know it's really easy to authenticate them. You know, I mean, that's one thing about it. You, uh, it's easy to authenticate. You know, uh, with their, but for some reason uh, they don't. I, I guess the, you know I don't care about the ridicule. You know. Who cares? Mm-hmm. You know, I think I, it's become. I think that's really dying now. I think people are waking up to this, and they they are. I think there's a new level of appreciation for witnesses like yourself. And I think that they. they I mean, we've grown it for the past seventy years. It's been laughing at people that took an interest in little green men, but I think that is now changing. Uh, and and there is a real appreciation for people that can come forward and have got the strength of character to tell the story. Yeah, and. Uh, you know, I, I do get some uh, emails from the UK uh, on sightings. You know, they say, okay, here's what I've seen. Here's what I've uh, They go through it. I said, you got pictures? No. I says, that's the first thing you got to do, man. We're all, carry- we're all carrying cell phones. You got to take pictures. Take them. And some people said, I've seen it again. Here's some pictures. You know, it happened. Like, do you know what it is? I said, no. It's just- CFO. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's unknown to me. Um, you know, but they asked me in that. And, and, but you can tell there's certain ones. And if they're, <clears throat> what I do with some people, and I, I have friends at the uh, Lucas Labs that do the uh, uh, motion picture, you know, stuff. And uh, another one at JPL. And uh, if there's something that you know, stands out, I'll send it to them and say, can you uh, debunk it? You know, what is it? And 90% of the time, they, they debunk it. They say, well, this, 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 that, or whatever. And I'll pass that on to them. And, but there's also that, you know, well, I've had three cases, they don't know what it is. Well, you know, that's, yeah. Those are the ones that bother me, you know. Well, that's the point with any form of report is that um, even if it's only 3% or 5%, whatever it is, that's still anomalous. That's something to, we got to know about. And, uh, you know, even, you know, even if the rest of it can well, be drunk, you know. <coughs> if you take of all the reports every year and you say only 1% are probably uh, unknown, that's still like 5,000 cases. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot. There's, there's I mean, a lot out there, yeah. But uh, a lot of people you just don't know what the hell they're looking at. They don't know. It's even worse now with drones and stuff. They don't, you know, they'll send me stuff and that's a drone. They go, how do you know? It's a drone. That, that's why it's so <laughs> important to re- recapture the cases going back to, you know, not just Rendlesham, not just Roswell, 
952 Washington incident, you know, and um, the Battle of Los Angeles, all these incidents in the past where um, it just seems to have a bit more credibility because of the, the problems now, as you say, with, with drones and CGI. And it's unfortunate. And yeah. You know, then you get people to know how do not know how to use equipment. Mm -hmm. They think they know how to use night vision and they're clueless. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a recent night vision. You know, I had one person send me, a, you know, this um, orbs that were flashing, okay, <laughs> at a distance. First question, you have an airport in that direction? Wow, 12 miles away. Mm -hmm. I says, you got planes landing. I says, <laughs> I says the 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 trees are blocking it and it makes it look like they're orbs. I says, they're not. They're, mm -hmm. yeah. I says, well, I says, if you have a match and you light it a mile away and you got a night vision goggle, that, that stands out. I says, you know, so even though you can't see it with a naked eye, when you're looking at stuff, if you got a night vision goggle, you're picking up stuff yeah. 10,000 times. I said, and so they don't know what they're doing, you know. Yeah. Well, I think uh, in general, with all these mistakes being made, we're getting better at discerning and um, and this the information getting out there is helping right. people to become more vigilant and um, able to say, "Oh, that's this, or that's that." This is uh, yeah. I agree. I agree because uh, I know the ones from the UK are getting better. They're the <laughs> ones I just don't know. I don't know the answer to them. Like, oh, well, well, me and James know. have been on a few CE5 events, and we've seen a couple of things. So, you know, we've, we've taken a video. And I actually had one event where I had the camera going, and then it kept turning itself off. Um, and I heard oh, that, really? Yeah. <laughs> I hear mm. that that's happened before, and um, sort of Skinwalker Ranch uh, springs to mind. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, there's something to this uh, uh, communication, by the way. Yeah. There's something to that. I just don't know what. <laughs> I can't put it, you know, I can't put it in the words. But there, I know that um, uh, uh, there's been some really good research that's done. And then we had people are just doing it for money. Uh, Greer. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that guy's a fake. Okay. So, uh, uh, but there are, there are people that are actually with, these type of C5 type things that are, that are actual. I had one in Wisconsin uh, through this one person, uh, and it's um, it was one of the ones I sent off to, uh, uh, pictures I sent off to uh, uh, Lucas Labs, and they said, oh, we don't know what this is. It's not, it's not fake, you know, it's real. It's something there. They said, we don't know how they, it's not manufactured, you know, like in a film studio. And I said, okay. And I told her, I told the person about this. And she says, ah, I said, I think you got a legitimate C5 event there, you know, because the person, oh, because the person next to her didn't see nothing. Mm -hmm. he, yeah. he didn't and see that, nothing. That's, that's and and, and you know what? <laughs> yeah. I didn't see nothing. And, and I says, well, I says, show them the picture. That's what you, that's what you're seeing. You yeah. know, I says, there you are. I think I think trying to break it down simply, <clears throat> I think I, I've spoken to so many uh, physicists in the past year. I think the, the, the bottom line is every time you have a thought from a, a, a basic scientific point, an electrical impulse travels down a neural pathway in your brain. Now, although chemistry and biology will have something to say about that, that's energy transference, which is governed by physics. So consciousness needs to be understood through the viewfinder of advanced theoretical physics, and and we've never done any research on it. So so therefore, how you know so what what was previously classified as sort of you know magic is not necessarily magic. It's just science, but you need you need a really sophisticated understanding of this to really make sense of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that brings me on to a question: whether you actually, I'll, I'll start the question with: Do you believe in extraterrestrials? And if you do, is there a connection with the whole uh, the, the consciousness thing. Um, uh, I think there's probably somewhere there's probably um, life somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, is are they visiting us? No. Okay. No. Uh, no. They, I have to. See, I have to see a lot more evidence from that. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah. do, you, do you find yourself looking back at your own experiences now, Jim? Because this, the fact that you've got a download 
would suggest that you had some sort of I mean, I, 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 some, some words carry a lot of baggage, uh, but there, there's no other word that I can use to describe. So you had, it would appear, some sort of telepathic exchange with this craft. Do you, do, you, do you frame it like that in your own mind, or do you, do you, is it easier to think about it in, in, a, in another, another way? No, I, I, I think it was, uh, it was commun definitely communication. I mean, that was, that's, you're right. Was it telepathic? Yeah. Uh, well, I guess so. Uh, I touched the craft and that activated it. Or was that a circuit that I made? Yes. Or, exactly. or why did it stop after I let loose? Or did it was a, is that a button that transmits it? I don't know. You know, those are all good questions. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> they're tough ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, but going back, uh, we never did talk really about Kit Green. But uh, Joseph, uh, but with um, Kit, uh, one of the things that he said that he, that he wanted to do uh, extensive MRIs and stuff on us is because uh, Burroughs and I were the closest. He has done this with 50 other people, yeah. and we were the closest. And he says, apparently, you can see things, he says, according to Green. If you're at 50, the farther away you are, say you're a mile you you are whatever you're prone to think psychologically uh wherever you have the, the tendency to think if you think of you're going to see mushrooms or you're going to see um i don't know um uh fairies or something like that that's what you'll see it's it's some type of uh, uh it's some way for them to hide hide the, the reality of what they are. And the closer you get, the least likely, they see this quarter in green, for that to happen. And when you, he says, in you, Jim, he said, you were right there. We believe that for some reason, you see it for what it is. It, that, 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 that cloaking that they, they do otherwise, you, you see it for what it is. Okay, I said, whatever. And... Uh, he says, well, we want to do the MRI on it. He says, because we believe, according to the other 50 people we've seen, that at least a signature in your brain that we can tell, uh, some type of chemical signature. I said, okay. And uh, so that was the thing that uh, he was saying, that that's why they want to do all this research on us. Mm -hmm. And I just said, oh, no, I'm not going you know, I'm not going to do that. Because I asked him, what, 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 why don't you just go one of the other 50? He said, well, they're not alive. Okay. I said, so we're the only two alive that have that been that close? And he goes, yes. And I go, oh. And I think, uh, I don't know. I, I, I've had people contact me that say otherwise, okay, that they've been pretty, they've had close contact. You know, so I just don't think they come forward and I don't think that, maybe that group of people know what's going on, you know, like um, whoever Green works for, Bigelow and them. Yeah. So how do you think uh, things are looking um, in terms of disclosure um, or in terms of finding out more about what, what is known or what technologies um, are being developed behind the scenes? Do you think there's a, there's a future for us to find out? Well, I... I tell you what, I understand why they'd want to know what the capability, if all these theories and and uh, uh, conclusions that we have are true, uh, boy, what type, what type of power would a government a, or uh, a part of a government have if they had the ability to control time? Mm -hmm. What well, kind of power is that? Oh, it's the ultimate weapon, isn't it? Yeah, you could do anything you want. And no one would know. <laughs> just, just rewrite it. And so I, you know, and we're not even talking about the technology of, of, uh, of some of the other aspects of it, like you know, craft with no noise and you know things like that, and be able to go from make ninety degree turns at three thousand miles an hour and all this other stuff. I mean, we're not even talking about that kind of technology, which is would be put you leaps and heads. I had everything else, you know, um, 
so yeah, it's, we're going back to that whole thing about power and control. Mm. And that's yeah. what that's what they want. We 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 discussed this. I mean, I, I've been I've been quite guilty, Jim, in the past podcasts I've done with Joe of being uh, quite quite vocal about this this whole this what you're describing here, which is this what what type of mindset, what type of person is is that narcissistic that they have to have this degree of control over the entire human race? They're making decisions unilaterally on behalf of the human race it's really quite disturbing and and they're blocking our progress um is there anything you think that you can see i mean obviously because the, the encouraging thing to, tonight has been talking to you about the attitude of, of senior ranking military who were supporting you who were encouraging you uh, and and when you came when you came clean about this nobody tried to stop you which is very, very encouraging and speaks volumes about, you know, the integrity of some of the people at a senior level. So it's clear. Yeah, not- actually, actually, uh, James is everybody that when when I went, was going to go public, um, uh, especially with the books. Uh, yeah, they're one hundred percent behind us. One hundred percent. You go for it. That's you know, we had those kind of conversations. Yeah. I'm behind you. You know, that's and, huge. Uh, and, but but for disclosure, you're not going to see disclosure like. The kind that's being painted in Washington or through the UFO circuit speakers, okay, that ain't going to happen. There's no, I mean, first of all, anything that is unclassified, like a hearing uh, in Congress, they don't know nothing. Unclassified hearings are nothing. Because whatever, I'll tell you this much, everything that they do know is classified. And it's highly classified. And, I mean, you'd have to have hearings behind closed doors, um, only select people. You know, that, that, that stuff's not even happening or being thought of, okay? An yeah. open hearing on unclassified stuff is no better than going to a UFO con- conference, okay? But it's just, it's, you have to say now that that, that classified information Keeping it behind closed doors is not going to push the human race forward. That has to come out. Otherwise, how are we ever going to get anywhere? We, I mean, there probably needs – is is this – are these things remaining classified to protect certain people that have been guilty of making poor decisions or, the, or as you said, the people that are purposefully trying to keep hold of the power? I don't know the answer to that. I th- I think it's one of them. Yeah. You know, one of those. Uh, uh, I, it's. Uh, I suppose it's. I hate to use the term. Uh, it's about national security. I mean, uh, I guess they. It's the same reason that we don't publicize, you know, our new high-tech hyper weapons that we have and how to build them (laughs) so other countries can, you know, we don't provide that. We keep it classified. We keep it quiet because we want other people to know uh, and, uh, you know, to know our capabilities. I guess that's part of it. I mean, um, but they use that term national security way too much, okay? Mm -hmm. Because usually you're... Usually it's not national security, okay? Yeah. It's because they don't they want to they want to hide what they're doing. I think a lot of yeah. people in the community appreciate that we do do need to have some degree of of secrecy for national security reasons. But the degree they've used that to cover up everything has been just it's a crime against humanity. <laughs> yeah. It's now it's it was the stage where it's, they've committed a crime against humanity. <laughs> I know it. Uh, yeah, we we've we've done it often, you know. We've done it, especially since like World War Two. I mean, it's this horrible stuff. We <laughs> even now we find out stuff that we did back then in name of national security was just horrible stuff. There was no really no reason to do stuff, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like that. And we we find it out, you know, now looking back. Uh, I think that's the case for a lot of it. I think it's it's uh, outside of, you know the military secrets. Uh, yeah, I think you just got to have uh, information should be shared, you know, and especially yeah. with uh, this phenomena, you know. Yeah, it'd be interesting <laughs> to see how things pan out um, moving forward. It's not going away. 
Right. It's not going to go away. Right. No, no. So they might as well figure out how the best way to deal. And I always find the best way to deal with stuff, just tell the truth. Yeah. But yeah. It seems tell- like there was a, a, a moment in the 50s, possibly, that things were going to come out. And then suddenly Blue Book and everything happened and it kind of... Yeah, but I think, uh, you know, one of the discussions, and I do believe this, I believe for the last 80 years, we've had nothing but a disinformation program. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's all it is. It's, it's okay, you know, whether, you know, James was talking about a little green man. Yeah, that's part of it. They all went through it. It all started about the same time in the 40s. Uh, it's a lot of disinformation. Uh, doesn't mean all the things that happen aren't, something that needs to be investigated or what true i mean it's just that uh they they just like with rendlesham i mean the containment story they took you know they took the uh this ufo uh lore and said oh we'll apply it here it's just another ufo case well the last thing rendlesham is a ufo case it has nothing to do with it mm-hmm. the, the rendlesham has to do with the binary code it doesn't have nothing to do with me. has nothing to do with anybody else that was there. It has to do with that binary. That's the only thing that, that that's about. And But the containment story, yeah, we, we see lights in the sky. We'll go ahead and spread Because I explained in the book how uh, the disinformation went out, the containment story, to the pubs. And that's the best place to tell it. Go to the pubs. <laughs> Which go is to the pub and say. The Chinese whispers came from from the local people. Uh, yeah. And and obviously, if that had been a carefully orchestrated disinformation plan, that, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, I, I talked to a, a couple that were uh, civilian uh, witnesses. They were coming home from a party or something, I don't know, a Christmas party or some stuff. And uh, they told me it was disheartening because they heard all the stuff, this the containment story. And said, she said, well, this stuff was just, I don't know, it wasn't like that. She said, what we've seen. You know, I said, you know, where it was take off, it would stop, it moved, it turned, and then gone, and it was sitting over the RC. That's what they were telling me. I go, yeah, that's what happened. Oh, so he said, okay, well, that's not what we heard in the, you know, the chatter that was going around the pubs. And I said, yeah, it's all disinformation. And then we had people uh, uh, who weren't involved try to be involved, and they were putting out stuff books and stories and newspaper things. I'll tell you what, those London tabloids, they pick up on the the, the worst things with Rendlesham. They'll pick up something and say, case solved. First of all, when they say case solved, they're lying. Okay? It ain't nothing solved. You know, and then they'll come up. I mean, I've heard it all. The one about the SAS guy. The SAS guy, they said that, that that was from London newspaper. It's solved. Well, that's all true, and you know that was a pretty good article saying that it was the SAS. And, and yes, we did have an exercise with the SAS, but that was uh, two years later in July of 1982. Hmm. Well, you think a newspaper would just take a little time and check out the story hmm. instead of just publishing it as Reynolds from Solved? Well, that that's the biggest challenge is for, for the for the press all over the, the world now. The problem is these are commercial organisations that are trying to make money, and and uh, you know, I mean, we all value living in a free country where you can say whatever you like, but equally, um, for a lot of these organisations, they they are trying to sell papers, you know, get clicks, whatever they have to do to make their dollar. Uh, and and that's completely counterproductive, actually. Uh, and for actually, the it, truth it, coming out, it's harmful. You're right, and uh, yeah, that's the case. That's the case. Uh, and I, I tell you what, I I'm pretty sure that's not. I'm not just targeting London papers. I'm talking the news media as, as well. I mean, it's terrible. Yeah. They, well, it's all about money, I guess. Yeah, we we, uh, we hopefully will see um, a future where a bit more transparency and coming together all the deep polarizations and we can start to hopefully see a better future I, i'm i think we're at a turning well, point right now in in history where things are going it might not seem that way right now with all the chaos in the world but i, I feel like I we're, you what, we're in that turning I, point maybe I, and I, oh, gone dark james i, t- I tell you what uh, joe what's going to solve this is science okay the science will solve this okay. you know it's when they say well here's our conclusion here's what we worked out 
uh, you know, and it's just like with the Rendlesham case with the binary. The proof positive that Gary has done, it's the math. The math don't lie. Math is math. I mean, you can't make up numbers and try to make them work or fit a square. It doesn't work that way. Um, so the science will actually force uh, knowledge, the people to be knowledgeable what's going on. Yeah. Disclosure, though, that they're trying to manufacture uh, in these phony money making up i mean that's what they're talking about they're trying to sell paper they're trying to sell a, a documentary or something like that that that's not the way to do it but it, isn't it isn't it wonderful we can sit here and establish the fact that actually the truth is far more wonderful than any of this fiction because what we're talking about here is one man well a, a group of men in the night in december 1980 who had an incredible experience that were, were effectively given a piece of information that could help positively transform the future. That is much more a much more inspiring story than actually the pro principle that we've got, you know, <laughs> got flying around. I do agree with you exactly, and that's a, that's, that is the crust of it. It's it's the you know what, but right from the beginning, they you know with the cover up stories and all that stuff. They try to sensationalize. People try to sensationalize the event. You don't need to sensationalize. This is a, this is sensational on its own merits. You don't. You know. I agree with you. It's you don't have to try to sit there and make it more. I don't no. know. No. Yeah. yeah. Why? Why? Why do that? Uh, All you do is distort distort stuff. You know. <clears throat> yeah. Well, you've been very generous with your time, Jim, and I thought well, I wanted to leave on that sort of more positive note and. In terms of talking about, you know, the fact that this is a, a message about how we can get a brighter future ahead of for yeah, I think that's that's what you know up the vibe is about. It's about trying to think about how we can raise our vibrations and move forward in a positive manner. Uh, and I, I yeah. suggest, and you probably have a list of people you want to get on, but get a hold of Masters. Uh, he's just got a brand new book out that's excellent. Uh, um, then uh, I don't know Hancock. I mean, sure, I don't know oh, if Graham does. I, I don't know if he. I think he's probably overbooked with uh, their podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, I'll tell you what, Masters will get a hold of you. I mean, he's a. I mean, he he's a, a college professor, man. He's probably a busy time of year, but I'm telling you, uh, he's got some great ideas and thoughts and yeah. good research. Uh, those are the kind of people that uh, um, you should talk to. I don't. I uh, if someone is too busy to talk to you or something like that, there's a problem. <laughs> this is not about them. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's about something much bigger. Yeah. And that's what that's why I don't understand it. Yeah. Well, and I, uh, I think we're part of a important part of history right now. It's all, all in the making. We'll be able to look back on it and see see yeah. how it all unfolded and and and, and, and amazed and be amazed by it all. So maybe this podcast survives till eight thousand yeah. years. Yeah, maybe that's what I started this whole thing. I don't yeah, exactly. know. <laughs> no, I, I would have shaved if it was going to last eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. the humor! Well, well, thank you very much for um, for doing this. It's been been amazing and quite insightful. And I, I will say again that your your book has is really good, um, mm -hmm. and really gives a good account of of what happened. I'd really recommend people to read it as well, and also the Gary Osborne section afterwards where it talks about the code. Um, and mm -hmm. so, yeah, um, thank you very much. And yeah, and they can yeah. get uh, here's my plug Amazon is where they can go ahead and buy it from uh, the Rendlesham Enigma. And uh, I tell you what, if you already got like Amazon Prime or something like that, like most of us do, uh, it's free. You can get it, the digital one, free. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Or make a, we got Christmas coming up. Make a fantastic Christmas present. It would, it yeah. would, and I tell you, we're 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 looking at uh, uh, whatever the new uh, paper prices are out there, and we're because I want to reduce the prices as low as we can get it. You know the the paperback. Right. Yeah, well, hey, it's it's like eight hundred pages. Okay, I mean it's a th it's a thick paper back, yeah. and uh, well, let me grab it. I'm gonna show you. Yeah. I don't know if you have a copy of it. Or not, I'll probably pull a plug or something here. This is huge. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, 
Good God. <laughs> it's tons of information. And there's my plug for it. Um, uh, I tell you what, it, I, I think that's why I'm not doing a lot of uh, podcasting anymore or going to conferences. I wrote the book. <laughs> Everything I had to say is in there. Mm. At least I thought so until this is podcast. <laughs> There's always more to discover, but yeah. But yeah, yeah maybe I'm wrong. Account, definitely. Yes. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, it helps. And, and thank you, James, for, for thank you. And, and your questions and everything. And been, been good. All right. All the best to you guys. Stay healthy. Thank right. you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, right. for inspiring yep. us. Thank you, Jim. Yep. Thanks, Joe.